Hello, welcome to Connie Martinson Talks Books. My guest today has been called one of the great novelists of our times. Well, what makes a great novelist? To me, it's someone who breathes life into a historical character. And my guest, Gore Vidal, has done that with his most recent book, Lincoln, published by Random House. And we will be back after a short pause to talk to Gore Vidal, author of Lincoln. Do you think you have the power to change the world? I can shape the future one child at a time. I know I can make a difference in those children's lives, and I know I have. Who knows where my influence may stop? I teach. I teach. I teach. Yes, they're teachers, but to the kids they reach, they're heroes. I think I have the power to change the world. The influence is always there. Do you have the power to wake up young minds, to be someone's hero, to change someone's life? Reach for that power. Teach. If you want to make an impact on our future, call 1-800-45-TEACH. Want to change the world? I teach. I teach. I teach. I teach. I teach. Be a teacher. Be a hero. Enjoy a peaceful summer day. Because they're out here keeping that peace. The men and women of the Navy, out here today, safeguarding your tomorrow. Okay, Bravo, come on ashore. Welcome back. We're talking with Gore Vidal, author of Lincoln, published by Random House. Welcome, Gore. To see you again, Connie. And it is so nice to be able to say to you what a thrill it has been to read over 600 pages of such a fat, delicious book. And it is such a thrill for the author to go on a program like this in the comforting knowledge that you have read the book. I am so used to having people look quite glazed. Now, sometimes I say, now, what part did you find most interesting? And you see panic written all over oh, their faces. Listen, Gore, anybody Connie reads them. <laughs> with delight, because I get an awful lot of, as you know, the junk that passes through. Let's get to the classy part. This is a classy book, Gore. It is so marvelous to learn about Lincoln, warts and all. The man was a politician. He was not um, a saint. No, indeed, he was not a saint. He was probably the shrewdest politician ever to become president. He was cold, hard, brilliant, and somewhat mystical. And he rec recreated the United States in his own image. He took the old republic of the founders, which was a sort of loose confederation of states. And he had this mystical thing that the Union must not be dissolved. And the poor man arrives in Washington on a cold February morning in 1861 in disguise because mm -hmm. they were threatening to blow up his train in Baltimore. And four or five states have gone out of the Union, southern states, saying we don't want to be in any union of which Abraham Lincoln is the president. So what's he going to do? And he throws the dice. He suddenly, at, at his inaugural address, he said this, this union may not be dissolved. And if you try to leave it, he said, you will have to deal with me because I have an oath registered in heaven to preserve, protect, and defend. And the defend Constitution. is the word he hits. He hits the word defend. And now, he has no moral right, he has no constitutional right, he has no legal right to hold the South in. There was nothing in the Constitution. Yeah, well, of course, he would argue, well, since the yeah. Constitution says you can't leave, yeah. well, you can't leave, to which they said there's no mention of it because it was assumed we came together because it was convenient in 1786 to come together. Now, you know, ciao, we'd like to go. We don't want to live with you people anymore. And clever enough to put in his cabinet his opponents. Oh, yeah. I mean, he sort of, in, in all the, through the book, he is so manipulative this is a brilliant politician, especially with a man named Chase. Well, uh, and the, sh the political genius of Lincoln is something often overlooked, is that everybody, he was an unknown railroad lawyer from 
uh, Illinois. The head of the party was William Seward, who had been governor of New York, a very famous man, and sort of the boss of the, the new Republican Party. Then Salmon P. Chase, former governor of Ohio, a leading abolitionist. Well, now, Lincoln's genius was, first of all, these were all rivals, and he knew they were all conniving against him, so he puts them all in the cabinet. And he said, it's better I have them around a table, you know, I can keep my eye on them. You yes. know, they're not going to get up to anything if I can watch them. The other thing he did, which I admire tremendously from a subjective point of view, the problem with clever people, even brilliant people, is they can't help demonstrating how brilliant and how clever they are. But the political genius, which Lincoln was, never demonstrated it. So everybody thought they were smarter than he was. Yes. And he let them talk, and he let them show off, and he bided his time. I remember years ago, my grandfather, Senator Gore, was a very clever politician, and he said, the most difficult thing in politics for an intelligent man is to allow a fool to think he's making a fool of you. He said, that just goes against everything. Yes. But he knew how to keep his trap shut, and he waited and bided his time, and one by one, he buried his political rivals, and at the end, he was at the top of the heap. But what is fascinating, Gore, is also his tr problems with the army. I mean, with an army that doesn't want to fight under a man named McClellan, uh, who was really, thought he was a little Napoleon, went around posturing, and in his head, he wanted to be president, so if he could make Lincoln look badly, he had the right to sort of come in and say, well, look, this is a country where army uh, chief of state really means general of the army. Well, yes, Lincoln had a bit of bad luck at the very beginning that as the southern states went, all the best West Pointers, almost without exception, were southern boys because the South had a tradition of hunting and fighting and shooting and they were agricultural society. The North was uh, industrial even then. So all the best generals, from Robert E. Lee, on were Southerners, so he stuck with a bunch of West Point generals from the North, most of whom had been moonlighting, working for the railroads, as he himself had been a railroad lawyer. So he, then he has to make all these politicians generals, and he took Democratic opposition politicians in order to keep them quiet, and he made them major generals, so they were hopeless. And he, really for the first three years, he, he made a joke finally. He said the only victories he got were from the West. And what, yeah. that was a West Pointer called Ulysses yeah. S. Grant, was winning victories. He, sitting there with McClellan in the Army of Virginia, everything was going wrong. And Lincoln was trying to direct the war, and he wasn't very good at that. So finally, he's faced with the fact, with the victory at Vicksburg, with General Grant, and he decides, well, now the time has come to bring Grant in. And so he brings Grant to take over the whole war. And he said, you know, General Grant, it's something, he said, I am sometimes very slow to get the point to things, but I have noticed that the Army of Virginia, which I direct myself, never seems to get anywhere. And I notice that your army out west, over which I have no control, only wins victories. Now he said, I have got the point to this, General Grant. You're on your own. I'm not going to bother you anymore. But he said, I do have a question to ask you. He said, tell me why it was after the first great victory we've had in this war at Vicksburg, we never heard from you for four days. We only knew that there was a victory because Admiral Porter down in Mobile sent us a, a cable. And Grant said, well, said the wires were down between my headquarters and Washington. And Lincoln said, come on, that's no excuse. You, you, you captured the state, you put the wires up. General Grant said, well, I must tell you something, Mr. President, before every battle, I cut the wires to Washington. Segwaying with the, the General Grant period mm -hmm. is the scene with Mary Lincoln. I mean, Mary Lincoln is more than just the uh, crazy woman we've heard about. I kept reading in her gore, the woman who loved him more than he loves her. That mad, insane jealousy, the woman who's lost children, the woman who he had broken an engagement with for whatever reason and then comes back and she knows he's come back to her for other reasons than just pure love. And then the final part is, her fear of being not first woman, mm. first lady. Mm. Uh, she is a very full, almost a Lady Macbeth type character. Well, I think I'd, I'd, I'd only make one uh, adjustment to your analysis, which I think is correct, is that he, he adored her. 
as she adored him. It was a very happy marriage. She was going mad, literally mm -hmm. mad, and it wasn't, she wasn't neurotic, you know, which we would think now, which would have then been just misbehavior or just bad luck or something. They performed an autopsy when she died in Chicago sometime, I think, in the 1880s, and they found uh, that her brain was totally deteriorated, mm -hmm. which might have possibly have been, they suspected, paresis. So she was going mad. I think he was filled with great guilt over this. She had been the most charming, witty, upper-class woman of Springfield, Illinois. She came from one of the first families of Lexington, Kentucky. Abraham Lincoln was what they call a scrub, which means a low-class mm -hmm. boy. And like all great men, almost without exception, who come from way down the social scale, he marries above his station. She was a great catch, and she, was, she spoke perfect French. She was very well educated by the standards of those days. Very witty woman. He came up to her the first time they ever met in Springfield. And she used to tell the story, said, Mr. Lincoln came up to me, and he said, I want to dance with you in the worst way. And she said, that's just what he did. We will be back after a short pause with Gore Vidal, author of Lincoln, published by Random House. See this? In its earliest, most treatable stage, breast cancer is no bigger than the head of a pen. Now take a pillow and imagine it's your breast. You feel anything? Neither would the 45,000 women who would die of breast cancer this year. Don't wait. Get a mammogram. Call your American Cancer Society at 1-800-ACS-2345. This is not a commercial for baby food, or baby clothes, or baby toys. This is a commercial for babies. Now available in all sizes and colors. This is Buddy. His family couldn't keep him and took him to a shelter. He waited for a new family, but no one came. Now his time is up. He has one more day to live. The Coopers were going to adopt a dog, like Buddy, from the shelter. But the neighbor's dog had a litter and they took a puppy. It saved them a trip. It didn't save Buddy. We don't need litters. We need homes for pets like Buddy. That's why we implore you, spay or neuter your pets. Welcome back. We're talking with Gore Vidal, author of Lincoln, published by Random House. My grandfather was a, a friend of Abraham Lincoln. This hand you see right here shook the hand of Oliver Wendell Holmes, which took the hand of Abraham Lincoln. So this hand is only one remove from President Lincoln's. And that hand also then went forward to another generation, to John F. Kennedy. Indeed, yes, that hand shook and that hand. And as you come to that part of the book that is that inexorable night at the Ford Theater, mm. I, both as a reader and as someone admiring of your work, was interested how you bring the reader up to that moment. And you don't really pull them out too much. Mm. It is handled so beautifully, Gore. How did you write it? How long did it take to get it in the form you wanted? Lincoln is told in the third person. And it takes a lot of nerve after a time as a writer. Uh, nervousness, it takes a kind of wisdom, I should think, if I may use the word, mm -hmm. to know when not to write, write beautifully, mm -hmm. when not to decorate, when to hold the camera absolutely steady and just let it happen. This is the greatest mm -hmm. story in the history of the American Republic, and it is one of the greatest stories in the history of the Western world. It is the story of Abraham Lincoln and of the Civil War my great-grandfather fought 
on the southern side in the Mississippi Regiment, and he was wounded and taken prisoner at Chickamauga. On my father's side, my great-grandfather was a major with the Pennsylvania Regiment. He was a surgeon. My family was split right down the middle. Uh, the memories of that war are still reverberating from one end of the South to the other, anyway. That war is to us what the Trojan War was to the Greeks. Yeah. It's what this, gives us a historic yeah. resonance. It's a Greek tragedy feeling in this book. And simplicity was the key to Greek tragedy, which is why I've kept the prose very, very simple. And it's undecorated. I mean, the thing is so glorious by itself, I don't need to do anything but you make know, it clear. Uh, there's a point too, Gore, as I read it, and I thought, high school kids who think in terms of books as dull or difficult or Shakespeare, I want to say to them, don't assign this book. Just say, you shouldn't read it, so they'll all read it. <laughs> yeah. Because, as I said to you, I think I was fairly educated. There is so much I did not know. I did not know that Lincoln wanted to move the free slaves, the black men, women, to an island in the Caribbean. I didn't know that Mary Lincoln, who was from Kentucky, was really the one who was the freedom lover, who yeah. was for abolition. Oh, yes, she was a great abolitionist because she had seen slavery up close in Lexington. Lincoln had never seen much of slavery. He came from Kentucky, his section of it. Uh, there were no slaves around. He didn't have much feeling. Uh, he didn't want slavery extended to the new territories. That's the only argument. And he said, look, he said, if I can preserve the Union by freeing all the slaves, I will do so. If I can save the Union by freeing none of the slaves, I will do so. If I can save the Union by freeing some slaves and not freeing other slaves, that is what I will do, which is what he did with the Emancipation Proclamation. He freed all the slaves in the South over whom he had no control, and he maintained slavery in the North over which he had control. And you have a scene with him and the leading free black men of that period. Oh, that's that is a classic, Gore. That, that, is, that scene is such a classic. Well, it's a hair-raising scene. And I got it from a transcript of one of the black ministers who was there. About six of them came to the White House. And Lincoln said, look, we're winning the war now. I want your help, you're educated man. You're black. He said, the differences between our two races are so great that it is harmful for us to have you here, and it is harmful to you for you to be here. He said, I don't say this is good or bad. I say this is the way things are. Now, he said, I've got Congress to appropriate some money for me, and I can buy a strip of land down in uh, Central America, actually, what, what is now Nicaragua, which is un underpopulated. I want to colonize it with all the former slaves, all three million of them. Now, this is the whole workforce of the South. And I want, but they, they, they will need leaders, educated men like you people, and I want you to help me. And one of the black leaders said, but look, we, we've been here just as long as your family, if not longer. Why on earth should we go off to the wilderness down there when this is our home? And Lincoln said, all right, you are doing well, but what are you going to do with three million slaves who have never been educated, who are suddenly going to be free? Wouldn't it be better to put them there and they can have their own country? How are they going to live? He said, they're not educated. And the black minister said, well, you know, Mr. President, they've done very well for two centuries supporting their white masters in luxury and themselves. Now, if they didn't have to support their white masters in luxury, he said, I think they'll do all right. Lincoln had no answer. Gore. We're going to take a short pause. We come back. I'd like to ask you about a few things like habeas corpus, uh, censorship of newspapers, and the floating of government bonds to finance a war. All new things under Abraham Lincoln, president. We will be back with our guest, Gore Vidal, author of Lincoln, published by Random House. Hello, this is Steve Allen. Do you have a scientific or technical background in areas such as astronomy, mathematics, electronics, computer programming, chemistry? If you do, Recording for the Blind urgently needs your help to record college-level textbooks for blind and visually disabled students. If you can give just two hours a week, please call 213-664-5525 for more information. That's 213-664-5525. Abused and neglected children are crying out in need. Responding to their need is Children's Bureau of Southern California. We're very proud of how you've done. But we're starting to become a nice little family. Each child we help, each family we strengthen, 
Each community we serve means a brighter, more productive future for all. Won't you please help Children's Bureau of Southern California make a difference? Sharp perfection. What you end up with is a marine. Maybe you can be one of us. The few, the proud, the marines. Welcome back. Gore Vidal, Lincoln. I asked you prior to the break, Gore, habeas corpus, taxes, and censorship of newspapers. I mean, somewhere there was a little bit of wartime rights that were also used by FDR and then the Houston plan under Nixon, but it began with Abe Lincoln. Oh, I'll say it began with Abraham Lincoln. He, uh, he moved very quickly to take charge. First thing he did when the Southern st after Fort Sumter was fired on, he called for 75,000 troops. He made a raid on the Treasury. Congress wasn't sitting, so he just took some money out of the Treasury to buy guns with. Then when he was having his problem, you see, Washington was surrounded by the South. It was Virginia, which was leading the rebellion. And then Maryland on the other side, and Maryland was dying to go out of the Union. And he told Maryland, no, you're not going to go. And they said, oh, well, next time the legislature meets, we'll go. And he said, well, I guess the legislature won't be meeting very soon. So he put a garrison in Baltimore then he arrested the mayor of Baltimore and the chief of police, and he arrested the mayor of Washington, D.C., without any charges. And they said, you can't do this. Well, he said, there's something in the Constitution. Now, let me, let's look it up. And, oh, yeah, and I'm commander-in-chief in times of insurrection. He said, this, this is definitely an insurrection against the central government. So I think while I'm about it, and he said, I will suspend the writ of habeas corpus, which is the most sacred thing that we've got, which means that you cannot be arrested without due process of law, and you must produce the body, as it were, in a court. These people were never charged. Well, then they had troubles with the press. The New York Daily News was shut down. Watch out, you out there in the Daily News. We've got our eye on you. The Daily News was shut down for a while. The Chicago Times, I think it was, was also shut down. Editors were arrested right and left. And they had a high old time. The other thing he did was he seized, within two weeks, I think, of the taking office, he seized all the files of Western Union for one year, because they keep duplicates of telegrams to find out who the yeah. spies were and who were communicating with the South. So he definitely played hardball, as we say, as he went about it. Now, what, what I fear, of course, is that this book is going to be so popular with the American right wing. You They'll say, look, 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 you see, Honest Abe did all this. Why well, don't we? One question, Gore. Why does a book like this differ, and how different would it have been without the word a novel? Uh, coming from you without footnotes, etc. Well, the difference uh, between, I mean, this could just as easily have been a biography mm -hmm. of the presidency of Lincoln. I start when he arrives in Washington as the president-elect, and I end when he leaves in a box and he's dead, and I describe everything that happens mm -hmm. in between. I could, uh, it is as accurate, let us say, as I could make it, which is, means it's as accurate as most biographies. But no biographer should ever enter the mind of any mm -hmm. historical character. You, you can't. You don't, know what, you don't know what they're thinking. The biographer must say, well, on, on Monday he met so-and-so and is reputed to have said such-and-such such by the New York Times, but that's it. Uh, the historian must never even do that. Not even spe I don't think a historian should speculate on motive. Now, what I've done with Lincoln, I never enter his mind but one instant. And, but what I have done is I see him through the minds of people who actually lived. Mm -hmm. His secretary, John Hay, his wife, Mary Todd, 
Mr. Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Seward, the Secretary of State. So I enter their minds, which is only a novelist can do that. A biographer can't. So it's both a biography and a novel. And Gore, in the words of Mr. Chase, may I have your autograph, please? Well, with great pleasure, you should point out that Salmon P. Chase was absolutely insane on the subject of autographs. And if you would like a copy of our publication, Good Books, write to me, Connie Martinson, P.O. Box 69, 1640, Los Angeles, California, 90069. Well, we'll tell you about some other books we've liked recently. And now out in paperback, as it says, Washington, D.C., Into the Present. Uh, Aaron Burr, also in the Lincoln vein, a different look at the man who was not really a traitor, but had his own way of going from the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And 1876, yes, what did happen with Ulysses S. Grant with the cigars, the champion, the general who won? Uh, some other books from Time Immemorial. Joan Peters' book is one of the more important nonfiction books this year. She went to Israel, to the Arab countries, going about who were the poor Arab refugees. Well, surprise, she found out they were the Jewish Arabs, the people from Libya, Tunisia, all of the Arab countries who were displaced and came to Israel. And at the time that they came to Palestine, all they did was displace the same amount numbered people from the Arab world. Important book. Uh, while we were thinking it was Hitler, believe me, read this book again. This is documented. And if you would like a wonderful book about one of our presidents and a book that makes him come alive, Lincoln by my guest, Gore Vidal. And we'll see you next week. Meanwhile, support your local library. It's very important. Gore, thank you for coming. Thank you.